Sabora Gagani was born on September 14, 1991, in Tirana, Albania. At some point, Sabora's parents separated, and shortly afterward, her mother, Elisabetta, decided to move away with her children, relocating to Rome, Italy. There, Elisabetta worked tirelessly to raise her children on her own. Sabora was known for her cheerful disposition and quickly became popular among her school friends, who affectionately called her Sibi. She was a strikingly beautiful young woman with dark skin, tall and slender, with long, flowing hair and an energetic personality. Sabora enjoyed spending time with friends, attending parties and listening to music at high volumes. According to her mother, she had a deep love for children and dreamed of becoming a teacher. However, she was also drawn to the world of modeling and took her first step in that direction by competing and winning a regional beauty contest. Despite her modeling aspirations, Sabora's family needed financial support, so she began working as a waitress in a local restaurant, where she quickly earned everyone's affection. Fate took a turn when Sabora was 18 years old and met Marco, a 31-year-old tall, handsome, and charming man. Although little is known about him, it was confirmed that he had at least one sister and had been previously married. By the time he met Sabora, he was divorced. Sabora fell deeply in love with Marco, and their feelings were mutual. Unbeknownst to Sabora, Marco had a troubled past. According to those close to him, Marco had a reputation with the local police due to his violent tendencies and issues with drug use. About a year into their relationship, Sabora and Marco informed her family that they had decided to move to Spain, as Marco claimed that there were not enough job opportunities for him in Italy. They planned to settle in Torremolinos, a Spanish municipality in the province of Malaga. Elisabetta was not thrilled about her young daughter moving to another country with a man significantly older than her, but Sabora was an adult, and despite her mother's concerns, the couple went ahead with their plan. Upon arriving in Torremolinos in 2011, Sabora and Marco settled in the beach area of La Carijuela. Initially, the couple appeared happy, and Sabora maintained close contact with her mother, communicating daily by phone or social media. She quickly found work as a waitress in a local restaurant, and Marco secured a job as a cook and pizza maker. However, it soon became evident that the problem was not a lack of opportunities in Italy, but Marco's inability to keep a job, as he couldn't hold down a position in Spain either. As time passed, Marco's true nature began to surface, and jealousy-fueled arguments with Sabora became increasingly frequent. Elisabetta witnessed this firsthand when she visited the couple to see how they were living. During her visit, she noticed that the relationship was deteriorating with bitter and frequent arguments, even in her presence. Over the following months, Sabora returned to Italy several times, with some reports suggesting that she only stayed in Spain during the holiday seasons. It's possible that her return was also influenced by the fact that her residence permit had expired and she had been using a false Italian identity to travel. By late 2013, nearing the third anniversary of their relationship, Sibora returned to her mother's home and confided that she had left Marco for good. She was tired of trying to make things work and had decided not to return, realizing that the situation was not improving. But soon after, Marco showed up at the family's home, as often happens, swearing that everything would change. He even proposed marriage, and unfortunately, Sabora was swayed by his promises. Things did improve for a while, but eventually, Jealousy and violence returned to dominate their relationship. Elisabetta later recalled that her daughter began to feel increasingly frightened. On one occasion, Sibora confided to her mother that if she wanted to leave Marco, she would have to disappear as he wouldn't let her go otherwise. 
By June 2014, it seemed clear that any hope for reconciliation between Sabora and Marco had faded. Sabora left the house they shared and moved into an apartment. Once settled, she called her mother, telling her that she had ended things with Marco for good and that she finally felt as free as a butterfly. However, things started to become strange when, in early July, Marco called Elisabetta to ask if Sabora had returned to Italy. Surprised, Elisabetta asked what had happened, and Marco told her that two days earlier they had a heated argument, after which Sabora left the house, leaving all her belongings behind. Elisabetta didn't believe his story because Sabora had informed her a month earlier about her move, making it clear that Marco was lying by claiming she had just left two days prior. Adding to the worry during all that time, Elisabetta had received no news from her daughter. Deep down, she hoped that Sabora was following through with what she had said, leaving Marco and disappearing. But the situation took a chilling turn when, in a subsequent conversation, Marco told Elisabetta a different version of events. He claimed that a security guard at the residence had seen Sabora leaving with two suitcases, saying she had left without disclosing her destination. This contradicted his earlier statement that she had left without taking anything. The family waited anxiously for Sabora to make contact. They were certain that, even if she wanted to disappear from Marco's life without revealing her whereabouts, she would never completely cut off contact with her siblings, especially her mother. The last time anyone heard from her was on July 7, 2014, when she exchanged a WhatsApp message with Marco. After that, her phone was disconnected and there was no activity on her social media accounts. The following week, Marco traveled to Italy and visited Sabora's family. He shared a coffee with Elisabetta, lamenting the disappearance of his beloved and spoke with Sabora's brother, expressing disbelief that she had left without explanation, while insisting he had no idea what could have happened to her. During this time, Marco told Elisabetta that he had printed missing person posters and had been placing them around the area. He also claimed that Sabora had been seen boarding a bus, then suggested she might have traveled to Argentina. Additionally, he mentioned hearing that she had been spotted with a dark-skinned man, with whom she seemed to be arguing. However, Marco never did the most logical thing, reporting Sabora's disappearance to the authorities. That responsibility fell to Elisabetta, who not only reported her daughter missing, but also suggested that Marco might be involved. The police began an investigation, interviewing Marco as the last person to see her, but he repeated his story. The authorities confirmed that the couple had separated, though it seemed they were still in contact, as some of Sabora's personal belongings were found in the residence. This unsettling situation persisted for the following months. In 2015, in an effort to expand the search for cyber nationwide, the authorities sought the help of the association dedicated to disseminating information and images of people who have gone missing under unexplained circumstances. Unfortunately, this effort also yielded no results. Sabora's family, however, refused to give up and ensured that Italian media also circulated information about the missing young woman. Life continued for everyone, though in very different ways. While Sabora's family lived with the anguish of not knowing her whereabouts, clinging to the increasingly faint hope that she would return, Marco's life moved on, albeit with the same bad habits. During this time, Marco changed his appearance, shaving his head, growing a beard, and entering into two relationships, both of which ended with the women filing complaints against him. Marco remained in Spain, where, to those around him, he appeared to be a normal man, always greeting his neighbors with a smile, a regular at the gym, a fan of target shooting, and a lover of sports like baseball and martial arts. By 2023, nine years had passed since Sabora's disappearance, 
and Marco had a new partner, a woman named Paula. What was known about Paula's life was that before Marco, she had been in a stable relationship from which she had a daughter and a son. After the breakup, and once she began living with Marco, they had a child together. One thing that hadn't changed in Marco's life was his instability at work, and over the years, he had gone through several jobs. While working at a pizzeria, he became friends with a man named Victor Molina. One day, Marco approached Victor, asking for work, stating that he had been unemployed for a while and that his family was struggling. Victor, willing to help, gave both Marco and Paula jobs at his restaurant, where Victor's sister Victoria had been working until then. Later, Victor even rented an apartment to the couple. Paula proved to be an excellent worker, earning the trust and affection of her employers. However, the same couldn't be said for Marco, with whom Victor had several problems. The last straw came when Victoria arrived at the restaurant one day to find the employee bathroom door completely destroyed. Paula, deeply embarrassed, admitted that Marco had broken the door, accusing her of hiding there to have intimate relations with co-workers. This incident led Victor to transfer Marco to work under his direct supervision at another place. During her time at the restaurant, Paula had earned not only trust as an employee, but also personal affection. Victoria, in particular, knew that the relationship between Marco and Paula was not just troubled, but virtually non-existent. Paula confided that Marco had physically assaulted her. Her employers urged her to report him to the authorities, knowing that with his record, he would likely end up in jail. However, Paula downplayed the incident, claiming it was just four punches and a kick. To her employers, this explanation was shocking, but there was an underlying reason why Paula continued living with Marco. She revealed that social services had taken her children away after finding drugs in their home that belonged to Marco. Paula confessed that she wanted to leave Marco, with whom she said she no longer had a romantic relationship, but she lacked the means to do so and needed to maintain the appearance of a stable relationship to regain custody of her children. Since securing a steady job, Paula was closer to achieving that goal. She hoped to save enough money to rent her own place and separate from Marco. She also shared that she had been undergoing weekly drug tests at a clinic for months to prove she was drug-free, and she held out hope that by October of that year, she would be reunited with her children. While Marco was working at the new establishment, his performance did not improve, and he lasted only a month and a half. Victor, the owner, discovered that a kitchen knife had gone missing, and he reported the theft to the authorities. Shortly after filing the report, Victor decided to fire Marco. Just a few days after Marco's dismissal, on Tuesday, May 16, 2023, Paula was in high spirits. It was her day off, and she had plans for the evening. The next day, Wednesday, May 17, 2014, Victoria was looking forward to hearing about Paula's night when she came in for her shift. Meanwhile, back at the apartment, Paula was getting ready for work. It was around 11.30 in the morning when loud screams were heard from the apartment shared by Marco and Paula. While it wasn't unusual for the couple to argue, there was something different about Paula's cries this time. Her voice sounded desperate and she was pleading for help. Victor and another employee immediately rushed upstairs and began pounding on the door, asking what was happening and pleading with Paula to tell them if she was okay. One of the men claimed to have heard faint whimpers in the background. Seconds later, Marco's voice emerged, assuring them that everything was fine and that Paula had just gone back to bed. Paula's voice was no longer heard. The door remained closed, and something in Marco's tone set off alarm bells for the concerned men. Victor ran to fetch a spare key to the apartment from his house, while the other employee went to grab his phone to call the police. 
Hearing the men leave the door, Marco calmly exited the apartment and left the building. Minutes later, police officers and medical personnel arrived at the scene. They knocked on the door again, but there was no response. Victor unlocked the door for them, and what they found inside was far worse than anyone could have imagined. Lying on the floor was Paula's lifeless body, her clothes stained red with numerous stab wounds. The paramedics could do nothing but pronounce her dead at the scene, and it was clear that the suspected assailant was no longer present. Within minutes, the area was swarming with law enforcement, investigators, and medical personnel. Authorities immediately launched a manhunt for the suspect based on witness statements. The efforts paid off. A local resident identified Marco from the photo at a nearby establishment. Less than six hours after the incident, at 5.30 that same evening, Marco was apprehended while calmly drinking a beer. He offered no resistance, and the arrest attracted the attention of everyone present in the establishment and in the surrounding area. Marco was taken to the police station for questioning, while initial reports indicated that Paula had sustained 14 stab wounds to her body. In the days that followed, new details emerged, revealing the extent of Marco's manipulations. It was discovered that on the night Paula went out, Marco had been searching for her, even asking local taxi drivers for information on who had driven her and where she had gone. This was just the tip of the iceberg, as the surprises were far from over. Upon learning of Marco's arrest for the murder of his then-girlfriend, the pain of Sabora's mother, Elisabetta, resurfaced. She once again voiced the plea that had been her cry for many years. Incredibly, Elisabetta's plea was answered almost immediately. As Marco was being escorted through the police station, he stopped in front of a bulletin board displaying images from ongoing investigations. Among them was the missing person poster for Sibora Gagani, whose case had remained open for nine years. According to the officers, upon seeing the poster, Marco paused and dropped a bombshell. He claimed he wanted to cooperate because the memory of what he had done would haunt him forever. He confessed that he and Sibora had argued, and he had killed her and buried her in an apartment. And not only that, when the officers were still reeling from the shock, Marco offered to show them where he had hidden her body in the apartment they had lived in together. The authorities, cautious of his intentions, did not accept his offer immediately. Returning to the case at hand on Saturday, May 20th, Marco, 45, was formally presented in court. He exercised his right to remain silent and only responded to questions from his defense attorney, who requested a psychiatric and toxicological evaluation for her client in connection with Paula's murder. During this hearing, Marco said nothing about his earlier revelation regarding Sabora's case. The court ordered that Marco be held in provisional custody without bail while being investigated for the crime of murder within the context of gender violence and that he undergo a drug addiction protocol the same day. It was also noted that the court had reopened the investigation into the disappearance of Sibora Gagani, which had occurred nine years earlier. From that moment on, investigators set out to determine the truth of Marco's statements made at the police station. Over the next few days, a massive operation was launched. On Monday, May 22nd, Officers visited the apartment where Marco and Sabora had once lived. At that time, the apartment was occupied by another couple, who were fully cooperative with the authorities. In the following days, specialized teams meticulously searched every inch of the apartment located near the town hall and police station, where Sabora's body was allegedly hidden. The search of the apartment began with a visual inspection, looking for any irregularities in the walls or floors, but nothing out of the ordinary was discovered. Subsequent inspections involved the use of densitometers and micro cameras. Small holes were drilled throughout various parts of the apartment to insert cameras, 
and examined the interiors of the walls and floors. However, these efforts did not yield any positive results. According to the press, Marco continued to talk from prison, where he supposedly claimed that he had used acid to dispose of Sabora's remains. Meanwhile, investigators refused to give up, even after three fruitless searches of the apartment. During the fourth attempt, officers analyzed the building's floor plans and noticed that two identical apartments were located on the same floor. When they visited the twin apartment, they realized that there was a large space in the bedroom that did not match the layout of the apartment under investigation. With this clue, the specialists focused on a particular wall that appeared unaltered and was identical to the rest of the building, but in reality, concealed a hollow space behind it. With the necessary authorization, on June 6, the officers broke through the wall. Behind it, they found a large wooden crate filled with lime. As they began removing the lime, the first grim discoveries emerged. The first thing they found was a plastic bag containing a knife with dried blood. Next, they uncovered some objects that apparently belonged to the victim, followed by a bouquet of flowers placed on top of several plastic bags. Inside the bags, they found a camping sleeping bag, and within it, the remains of a woman. Following the gruesome discovery, the body was transported for an autopsy to confirm the cause of death and to establish whether the remains were indeed those of Sibora. Meanwhile, in Italy, Sibora's family was on edge after a friend informed them of Marco's arrest for Paula's murder and the search for Sibora's body. Elisabetta said that the news of her daughter's death at Marco's hands hit her like a bucket of cold water. She revealed that the only joy she had experienced during those years of uncertainty was becoming a grandmother, thanks to her son. She also shared that Sabora's father had passed away due to illness, without ever knowing what had happened to his daughter. Shortly after, Spanish authorities contacted Elisabetta to request a DNA sample to conclusively confirm that the body entombed in the wall was her daughter's. However, there was little doubt, as the remains bore some tattoos that had been reported as distinguishing features when the disappearance was initially filed. A Spanish team traveled to Elisabetta's home to collect a saliva sample, and the DNA comparison left no room for doubt. The body was indeed that of Sabora Gagani, who had gone missing at 22 and would have been 31 at the time of discovery. After the autopsy, it was revealed that despite the condition of the remains, the cause of death had been multiple stab wounds. More than five months after Sabora's remains were found in the wall of the apartment she had shared with the man who would become her executioner, her family announced that she would be coming home. Finally, Sabora's family and friends were able to bid her a final farewell in a funeral service. At the end of the service, friends of the young woman released balloons into the sky with messages written for someone who had once been a cheerful, good friend who only dreamed of becoming a model and finding happiness. After enduring the hardest moment a family can face, all efforts were now focused on ensuring that justice was served and that the person responsible for Sibora's untimely death would be punished to the fullest extent of the law. On Tuesday, January 30, 2024, Marco was testifying before the court in a hearing requested by his defense attorney. However, instead of speaking, he handed over a 17-page handwritten letter in which he admitted responsibility for Paula's death, but with notable caveats. In the letter, Marco claimed that he and Paula had a tumultuous relationship fueled by large amounts of alcohol and cocaine, which they both consumed. He confessed to taking Paula's life but alleged that she had been agitated because he owed her 50 euros and she had discovered his infidelity. Marco claimed that his only fault was defending himself too forcefully, 
though he did not explain how the woman's wounds ended up on her back if the attack was in self-defense. Despite his partial confession, Marco remained silent about Sabora's case, stating only that he had wrapped her body in bags, placed it in a wooden box, covered it with flowers, filled the box with lime, and built a false wall to conceal everything. However, he denied being responsible for her death, though he admitted that what he had done was disgusting. Amidst all his lies, Marco claimed that since his arrest, he had experienced a profound spiritual awakening and was now deeply remorseful. Marco claimed that members of the Albanian Mafia were responsible for the death of Sibora. According to his twisted story, these dangerous men had loaned him 25,000 euros to start a business, specifically a brothel. However, Marco claimed that some Colombians had stolen the money after a night of partying, leaving him without the funds to start the business and unable to repay the loan. One day, the Albanian mobster showed up at his home to collect the debt. There were four armed men. One pointed a gun at Marco while the other three confronted Sabora. Marco claimed that during the heated exchange, one of the mobsters attacked and killed Sabora. He added that the mobsters took 9,000 euros he had stashed in the house from his small-scale drug deals and told him that the rest of the debt would be forgiven if he disposed of Sabora's body. Given the circumstances, Marco agreed to their terms. He claimed he spent two days with Sabora's body in the apartment, unsure of what to do, before deciding to wall it up. As of the time of this writing, Marco's fate remains uncertain. The latest information we found was dated May 16, 2024, indicating that the court had decided to proceed with a jury trial for the case of Paula's death on charges of murder and domestic abuse. However, no estimated date has been found for the judicial process concerning Sibora Gagani's case. Thanks for tuning in to Unreal True Crime. If you're intrigued by mysteries from around the world, check out our new channel, Latin Crimes, where we dive into the gripping true crime stories of Latin America. Don't miss out. Subscribe now for more thrilling investigations.